The Pacific Motorway is the main road link between the Australian states of Queensland and New South Wales. Starting in Queensland's capital of Brisbane, population 2.5 million, the 150 kilometers long motorway travels south past the tourist haven of the Gold Coast, before terminating in the small New South Wales town of Brunswick Heads. At this point, it becomes the Pacific Highway, beginning the 780 kilometer journey to Australia's biggest city, Sydney. Sections of the motorway accommodate up to 170,000 vehicles per day, making it one of Australia's busiest roads. The motorway's last major upgrade in 2008 was the $543 million Chugun Bypass. Costing over $70 million per kilometre, this 7.5 kilometre long upgrade to the road was at the time Australia's most expensive roadway. Prior to the completion of the Chugun Bypass, Traffic on the Pacific Motorway had to pass through the Gold Coast suburb of Chugun on the Gold Coast Highway. The Gold Coast Highway has a speed limit of 80 km per hour, compared to the Pacific Motorway's 100 km per hour limit. Additionally, the highway has multiple traffic light intersections and frequent access to adjacent residential roads. Both of these factors combined making the Chugun section of the highway a notoriously slow bottleneck. The solution was the Chugun Bypass, traffic would be diverted onto a new controlled access road just before entering Chugun, before rejoining the old motorway alignment after Chugun. Preliminary studies indicated the Chugun Bypass would reduce travel times on this stretch of the Pacific Motorway from 30 minutes to 5 minutes. So let's look at some of the engineering challenges that were overcome during the construction of this road. The first challenge was presented by Chugun Hill. This 25-meter high formation fell in the path of the proposed road alignment. Normally, this would not be an issue. A cut excavation would be made through the hill slightly wider than the width of the road. The extra width is required to form a series of flat benches along the sidewalls of the excavation. The issue arises from the fact that a residential property existed on one side of the hill. The property, owned by the founder of Australian surfwear brand Billabong, was only accessible by a single road atop of the ridge of Chugun Hill. This road would be destroyed during the excavation process, leaving the hilltop property inaccessible. So, the government had two options. Buy the property off the private owner, allowing them to cut off access to the property. Or, allow the owner to stay in the property and build them a private bridge to cross the newly excavated valley. So the government ran the numbers. The 120-meter-long two-lane bridge would cost $1 million. However, the hilltop mansion with Pacific Ocean views, belonging to at the time, Australia's eighth richest person was valued at an estimated $20 million. Clearly, the government was going to go for the cheaper option, even if that meant paying for a private bridge for one of the country's richest businessmen. The decision generated a lot of media attention and led to locals referring to the crossing as Billabong Bridge. The construction of the bridge also required an unorthodox technique called top-down construction. This is because the bridge had to be in place before the hill was excavated, otherwise access to the property would be disrupted. So, the superstructure of the bridge was initially built fully supported by the hill. However, once the hill was excavated, piers would be required to transfer the weight of the bridge to the rock below the final excavated level. Firstly, steel tubes were pile-driven into the earth to a depth of approximately 30 meters. The tubes were then excavated using an auger, which lifts the soil to the top of the tube for removal. The steel tubes resist the pressure exerted by the soil on the excavated cylinder that would otherwise cause it to collapse, and also provide corrosion protection to the reinforced concrete pier, which is cast in place as the final step. An additional benefit of top-down methodology is that construction workers on the bridge are never exposed to the danger of heights. Now, the hill excavation could proceed and the bridge was fully supported by the piles, which were slowly exposed as the level of excavation moved downwards. And during this entire process, access to the hilltop property was uninterrupted. The Chugun Bypass also features a 334 meter long tunnel with a number of unique constraints. The tunnel is approximately 3.5 kilometers away from the Chugun Hill Bridge. And at this location, the road is bounded by the Gold Coast Airport runway and the Kobaki Broadwater on either side. On first inspection, it is difficult to understand why a tunnel is required, since the bypass could simply pass between these two obstacles. However, Gold Coast Airport was due for an extension to its runway to be completed at the same time, which would intersect the alignment of the road. Furthermore, 
The adjacent Kobaki Broadwater is a sensitive environmental zone home to numerous endangered species, so it was not permissible for the bypass to interfere with it. With these two constraints dictating the road alignment, the only option was to construct a tunnel beneath the future airport runway extension. A top-down construction method was required to allow the airport runway extension to be built concurrently. Firstly, excavations were made on either side of the tunnel alignment for the side walls. These 1 meter thick and 20 meter deep side walls are known as diaphragm walls and their purpose is to retain soil and to prevent the ingress of groundwater. Once the trenches for these walls were excavated, they were immediately filled with a bentonite slurry. This mixture of clay and water exerts a pressure against the weight of the soil around the trench, which would cause the trench to collapse in on itself otherwise. Reinforcement can then be lowered into the trench before concrete is pumped to the bottom of the trench. The concrete is denser than the bentonite slurry, which causes the slurry to be displaced and exit the top of the trench. The diaphragm walls were cast panel by panel along the entire kilometer length of the tunnel and approach ramps. In addition, a number of barrettes or short discontinuous segments of diaphragm wall were constructed along the center line of the tunnel. The machinery used to excavate the trenches for the diaphragm walls were subject to height limitations due to the vicinity of the operating airport runway. With an allowable height of 6 meters above ground level, special low headroom machinery had to be obtained and any exceedances of the height limit could only occur at nighttime when the runway was not being used as frequently. Once the walls had cured to their required strength, excavation of the interior of the tunnel commenced. After the first stage of excavation, the tunnel roof slab is cast. The roof slab spans between the perimeter diaphragm walls and the central barrettes and is designed to handle the loads of moving aircraft on the runway. Once the roof slab had cured, the airport runway extension was able to proceed. At the same time as the runway extension, excavation began first on the access ramps, before proceeding to the inside of the tunnel beneath the roof slab. Finally, concrete walls were cast along both sides of the tunnel entrances to prevent water from entering the tunnel in the event of a flood. These 2.7 meter high walls will provide protection for a 1 in 100 year flood. To finish off the video, it's worth mentioning the Wallum Sedge Frog. This tiny, 25 millimeter or 1 inch long frog has a significant population in the wetlands of the Kobaki Broadwater near the bypass. Wallum is an indigenous word for the type of shrubland ecosystem present in this region of Australia. The frog is considered vulnerable, and although the bypass would not destroy a significant area of its habitat, it would split the population on either side of the road. As such, fauna culverts were constructed beneath the road surface to allow the frogs to pass without the risk of vehicular collision. Furthermore, a study determined that these frogs have the ability to jump up to 400 millimeters high, or 16 times their length. So, sufficiently high frog-proof fences were installed along sections of the road passing through their habitat, ensuring frogs had to use the culverts if they wanted to cross the road. It's amazing and perhaps even inspiring how an animal so tiny and seemingly insignificant can influence the design of a half a billion dollar infrastructure project. I hope you enjoyed learning about the construction of the Chugun Bypass and the unique challenges it presented. If so, be sure to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.